this is a presentation on mini kubeflow mini kubeflow is a product that we announced today essentially a packaged version of kubeflow so that you can run it on your local machine and get onboarded and be able to use kubeflow as fast as you can so are you familiar with what kubeflow is yes you're on kubeflow day but if not Kubeflow is a way to containerize ML components for Kubernetes. I'll be talking more about this later on because, you know, this can take like five or ten minutes, which is very short. So the fastest and easiest way to run Kubeflow. Okay. What's the story? The story is run these two commands, wait for a few minutes, and be done. So this is what I'll demo today. So to get Kubeflow up and running, you go into a command prompt, you create a directory, you switch into this directory, you use Vagrant, which is a tool to manage virtual machines, to initialize it based on a box that we produce. We call it mini kubeflow. Okay. And then you ask Vagrant to bring up the machine. This is it. So at this point, I've already downloaded the about eight gigabytes that this box requires because it's kubeflow is a lot of code vagrant is extracting this code and then we run a short provisioning script so you can try it out so are you familiar with minikube for example minikube is a very easy way to run kubernetes on your local machine and start experimenting with kubernetes apis why is this important because you can have a full Kubernetes deployment and you can use the exact same APIs. You can deploy your, your uh, workloads in the exact same way you would, you, you would on the cloud. So mini kubeflow is mini cube plus kubeflow on this mini cube plus rock Arictos, our own data management software. So you have a full deployment of kubeflow on Kubernetes with our data management software that you can use locally in a few minutes. And this is now uh, uploaded to the internet and you can go and try it out right now. I mean, don't do it right now because A, I'd like to be paying attention to me and B, the network here may not be as fast to download eight gigabytes of data. So this is progressing and it's copying lots of stuff on my disk. So I'll switch to the presentation and talk a bit more about Kubeflow. So what is Kubeflow? This is a, a figure from Google's TFX paper. TFX is Google's internal machine learning infrastructure. So Google is essentially open sourcing all of these components. To build a machine learning pipeline, you need lots of components that have to do with how you manage your uh, the different steps of building a, a ML models. Okay, all of these components have been containerized and have been open sourced and Kubeflow is containerizing these components so they run as components on Kubernetes. So Kubeflow is a project to run machine learning workflows on Kubernetes. So this part of TFX is essentially the focus of Kubeflow. Okay, and then you need an orchestration and configuration framework and Kubeflow uses Kubernetes for this. So Kubeflow orchestrates these components as pods on Kubernetes. Okay, and then Kubeflow provides an integrated front end, a user interface. So you can manage these components. And this is what we are contributing to Kubeflow, a user interface to manage notebooks. Most data scientists begin with notebooks. So we are contributing code to Kubeflow to manage notebooks easily and efficiently. And then there's these two big white boxes at the bottom that are garbage collection, data access controls, and pipeline storage. So where do you store your data? And this is what our software brings. So when people talk about ML pipelines, they omit the most important part. How do you handle your data? And you can always go to an external data lake to be fetching your data and uploading it back to the data lake, but this is not efficient. This doesn't work if you want reproducibility, if you want performance. 
if you want to work in a, in a hybrid fashion. So we combine Kubeflow, our improvements to Kubeflow's user interface, which we contribute as open source to Kubeflow. We are core of Kubeflow contributors. And our software for data management into a whole. And this is what mini Kubeflow is for a local deployment. Okay? So what can you do then? Our business is planet scale data management. We allow you to take your data, a local file system that you have mounted on your pods that you are uh, manipulating from within your notebook, and we allow you to snapshot it, take multiple points in, in time snapshot, one snapshots, one every five minutes, for example. We allow you to version these snapshots and package them. This is similar to what Git does for your code. We are essentially a Git for your data. And then we can distribute these snapshots. And you can share these snapshots with colleagues in a completely decentralized way over a peer-to-peer -peer network. If 10 developers are sitting here and producing data snapshots, they exchange these snapshots in a secure way over local links. You don't have to upload something to the cloud to bring it back. Make sense? So before I move on, let's see what Mini Kubeflow is doing. It's done. OK, and we started like three minutes ago. OK, run Vagrant SSH, get started. Great. Let me move to the top of the screen. OK. And then there was a welcome message that I cleared that said, run the mini KF command. OK, I'll run it. And this is essentially our provisioning script, which will make sure that everything is up and running so I can start using Kubeflow within minutes. OK. I'll run the provisioning script. I'll accept the end user license agreement. I'm a very fast reader, actually. <laughs> and now the provisioning script runs and ensures everything is up and running. So the provisioning script will deploy Minikube, will deploy Docker, will deploy all of the different Kubeflow components, will make sure they are up and running. And eventually, it will make sure our software is up and running. And then we can demo using the full set of Kubeflow APIs over this local deployment. So let's give it some more time. It accesses the network to make sure there are no new versions. And the network here is not super good, so there might be a bit of a latency. This happened uh, in the first demo as well. And this is all live, right? It's happening right now. So what you're seeing is actually what's going on right now. And because we don't like silent periods, I'll switch here and show you how I can log into Mini Kubeflow and essentially use it as a local Kubeflow, uh, Kubernetes deployment. It's still running. OK. Is the network working? Yes, it is. So let's give it some more time. What is it doing? It's updating stuff. OK, why is it updating stuff? Because it's deploying Docker. OK. Our app get update seems to be not progressing, and I'll blame the network for this, but anyway. See, I can always blame the network and it works. I didn't do anything, I just gave it some more time. And then we're provisioning Minikube, and then we're making sure Kubernetes is up and running, and I can actually use this as a Kubernetes deployment. So I can go and say, tell me what pods are up and running right now. These are the pods that are up and running. 
and the software is initialized in itself as Kubernetes components. But you don't need to know this to run this. You can just be sitting here and watching the provisioning script run. And what the provisioning script does is it makes sure that all of the distinct components are in place before it says, OK, you can use this. So it makes sure to pre-download a notebook image that you can use to spin up your notebooks quickly. It makes sure to ensure all the components are up and running. And when they're up and running, and it's been like, what, five minutes after the machine came up? So within 10 minutes total, you can have your own Kubeflow running locally. So let's give it some more time and talk about what we'll be demoing after that. This is a uh, machine learning pipeline. It's three steps, for example. At each step, you want to be fetching some data, manipulating it, and then producing data for the next step. So if you use a data lake, a big S3 deployment somewhere, what most people do is they download from this lake because they need the data to be local. Otherwise, performance is super bad. Super bad sorry. And then they upload the data back to the data lake. So your performance depends on where your data is. And this brings your computation close to your data. You cannot be running somewhere and having your data somewhere else. This will be super slow. Using our approach allows you to essentially use us as the local data management layer. Each step uses a local disk to manipulate data. And we snapshot the disks after each step. We give you APIs in the pipeline to manipulate this. So you can have a snapshot of whatever each step produced. And this allows you the pipeline to be traceable and reproducible. What's the biggest problem in running a machine learning pipeline or any automated pipeline in general? If something doesn't do what you expect it to do, there's no way to actually go inside the step and see what it happened, what it did. So what we allow you to do is, oh, this step failed. OK, this is where it started from. This is the output it produced. I already know its code because I have committed the code for the pipeline in Git. So let me retrace each step exactly. This is what you can do if you run our software. That's, that's our end goal. So what is our end goal with Kubeflow? It's having an end-to-end -end story that starts from multi-user notebooks, multiple users working on the same Kubeflow deployment, each spinning up their own notebooks, sharing their data, spinning up pipelines from within their notebooks, and then creating new notebooks to explore pipeline steps. So what could this final result of the pipeline be? A model, a trained model. So then you can have a serving pipeline that starts from this model and serves. So why is this important? Because you can have a training pipeline here producing the trained model here as a snapshot. And then you can have a serving pipeline running somewhere else that starts from the trained model as an input to serve. So you can split a full pipeline in individual steps that run in different locations because you can very efficiently get output from one step running as input for another step. And you can also recreate the pipeline, because if you can recreate its input and its code, you can recreate it fully. So let's get back to this. It's up and running. How much time passed? 10, 15 minutes at most. OK. So I'll go here. I'll go to the URL. And this is Kubeflow. You've deployed Kubeflow, and you have it up and running locally. So you can go explore Kubeflow APIs right now. So I'll do just that. I'll create a notebook, create a pipeline, then create a notebook again to explore one step in the pipeline. So I'll create a notebook. This is the, this is the pipelines component of Kubeflow. This is the notebook components. This is uh, release 0 0.4. We have contributed a new user interface for release 0 0.5. 
Okay, I log in. I'm creating a new notebook from this image. This notebook will have this much CPU and this, this much memory, and it will have a new volume as my workspace. This is where I'll be storing my Python libraries, for example. And I'll create a data volume that I will mount under pipeline data two, and it's gonna be one gigabyte in size. And this is where I'll leave my data as I work in the notebook, so then I can start a pipeline from this data. So I spawn the notebook. At this point, Kubeflow contacts Kubernetes and asks it to create a new pod that will be used as my notebook server. So I can go back to mini Kubeflow and query the pods and see that my container is being created, 19 seconds into being created, 25 seconds, running within 27 seconds. So it took me 30 seconds to get my container, my notebook up and running. I go back here. Jupyter Hub hasn't actually realized the pod is up and running, so I'll just refresh. The new user interface polls more frequently, so it comes up even faster. My notebook is up and running. So you deployed Kubeflow within minutes. You deployed a notebook on Kubeflow, and you can start using it. So I have the place where I leave my data. It's empty, PD2. I'll spin up a terminal, and I'll create a very complicated data set, which will consist of three files. But this is a proof of concept for any kind of data processing, right? At this point, I could be going to my data lake and fetching in a few gigabytes of data. This is a local volume, so it doesn't cost to move 100 gigabytes of data from one step to another. It's just there. Another step can come and access the data instead of having to upload 100 gigabytes of data to S3 and then bring it back and paying the associated cost in time and money. So this is where I'll be leaving my data, PD2. I'll create, let's say, time is uh, 0132 UTC. I'll create a few files here. OK. I'll create three files because this is the kind of pipeline that I'll run later on. So I have created three files. OK. This is the current state of my notebook, three files inside this directory. This is my data set. And now what I'll do is I'll access our software on mini Kubeflow. We call it Rock. And I'll take a snapshot of this notebook. I'll essentially create a starting point for a pipeline from this notebook. So I log in. This is an empty bucket. We organize data sets in buckets. OK. I'll bring in a full Jupyter Lab, my notebook server. OK. It auto completes that this is the one that I'm currently running. And at this point, I'm essentially creating a data commit. So this is why it, this looks like Git. I'll be committing my seed commit for, pi, for a pipeline, for a Kubeflow pipeline. OK. Um, the, the message will be create three files, uh, seed a pipeline. OK. And at this point, this creates an asynchronous task. My notebook is still running that snapshots my notebook. So Rock can be creating multiple point-in-time snapshots of my notebook as I work. And I can then use these snapshots as starting points for pipelines. So this is the task. It's almost done. Everything happens thinly. So if I take another snapshot after three seconds, it will take 10 seconds. It's done. OK. 
And now my snapshot is done. This is my snapshot. I snapshotted Jupyter user. I snapshotted my data volume and my workspace volume. So I'll keep the URL to the snapshot of my data volume because this is where I'll spin a Kubeflow pipeline from. I copied the, the URL here. Okay. So now let's see this pipeline. This is another Kubeflow API, pipelines. So this is pipelines. This is the definition of my pipeline in Python. So Kubeflow pipelines defines a Python-based domain-specific language to define your machine learning pipeline. So my pipeline is a Python function. It starts from a rock URL, the one I just copied, and it says, create a new volume as a clone of this snapshot, this parameter. First step is to mount this volume as slash data and concatenate all files into a gzipped file. So first step is gzip everything into full.gz. Then snapshot the results of step one so I can retrace what step one did seamlessly. Second step is clone this snapshot into volume two. This happens thinly. If this was a 100 gigabyte volume, I wouldn't have to copy 100 gigabytes. Step two is unzip this data, full.gz, and create data slash full. That's what gunzip will do. Okay, and use volume two as your data, your slash data, and take another snapshot. And step three is start from a clone of this snapshot and just show me what's in data slash full. What do you expect to be in slash data slash full? The concatenation of all three files. Okay? So I'll compile this pipeline using the Kubeflow Pipelines compiler. And compiling the pipeline produces an Argo workflow that we will then submit to Kubeflow Pipelines. So this is the compiled result, a big YAML file that you don't really have to see. You were seeing nice idiomatic Python, but this is the end result. A big YAML file. Okay. And then I can log into Kubeflow Pipelines, which is here. And I'll upload a new pipeline, the one I just compiled. Example five. Okay. And I'll... Do I have to create a new experiment? I don't remember. Let me create a new run. Yes, I do have to create a new experiment, so I'll create a new experiment first. Call it experiment one. And now I'll create a new run of this pipeline. Okay. Run name is going to be run five. And the pipeline needs a rock URL to start from. It needs the seed snapshot. So I'll go into rock, get this link, and give it two pipelines. Why is this important? Because I can run multiple pipelines in parallel with different parameters from the same snapshot. Why do that? Because I'm an ML data scientist. I want to try out the same uh, model from the same input data with 10 different values for a hyperparameter. So this is how I do it programmatically. I give it the same input data. I give it a different value for each parameter. And they run the same pipeline 10 times. And Kubeflow has components that do it automatically. And we are extending these components to work over persistent volume. So creating the pipeline run. And what, what, what this will do is will essentially show me the pipeline graph being created. So initially, we create a volume. Volumes are this kind of pink red color. And the volume has been created. So this is a persistent volume on Kubernetes managed by our software. And now step one is running. OK, let me refresh. Step 
Step one is still running, okay. Step one ran. Snapshot one is being created again as a Kubernetes resource. And because this is all Kubernetes, I can go into Minikubeflow and ask, give me a list of persistent volumes, okay? This one, this volume is volume one. It's this run of this pipeline. It's bound and managed by Rock. Okay, give me a list of snapshots. This is the first snapshot, it's been created. Okay, give me another list of volumes. Now there's a new volume. Why? Because the pipeline is running as we speak. So if I switch to the pipeline's UI and refresh, volume two was created, step two ran, snapshot two is being created all automatically. Okay, give me a list of snapshots. Snapshot two is there, 17 seconds ago. Okay, let me refresh. The UI, however, does not refresh that well, so it will refresh eventually. S snapshot two is done. Volume three has been created. Step three is running. Same thing, another volume would have been created. So we orchestrate the creation of Kubernetes resources from pipelines. This is the easiest way to run full Kubeflow pipeline locally. And finally, step three is done. I can go into each step and look at input and output. I can look into logs, and the logs of step three is the concatenation of the three files, because the definition of step three was to cat the slash data slash pool file. So this proves that all of the steps ran. But let's say that step two had a problem, okay? Step two uh, uh, misbehaved. Okay, I'd like to see exactly what its output was, snapshot two. Maybe I also want to see what its input was, snap one. So what I'll do is I'll destroy my notebook. I'll stop this server, Jupyter Hub, allows us to run a single notebook here. Running multiple notebooks is not very easy, but the new user interface of 0 0.5 will show multiple notebooks at once, so I wouldn't have to actually destroy my notebook here. Okay. So what I'll do is I'll spawn a new notebook and I'll attach snapshot one and snapshot two into this, onto this, so I can see what step two did. So. I'll be creating a new notebook. Okay. This notebook will be empty, but I'll attach an existing snapshot, which will be step one. So I go here, I see that Rock has picked up the two snapshots. So I'll attach snapshot one as amount point snapshot one on the notebook and I'll also attach snapshot two as another this is the old Jupyter lab and it's dead of course sorry for this let me close it and I'll attach snapshot two did I copy it correctly I don't remember let me try it again I'll attach snapshot two here okay so I'm creating a notebook to explore the execution of the pipeline. This is full insight into how the pipeline ran. Okay, creating the notebook. Again, underneath, I can see that my notebook is being created as a, a Kubernetes pod. Okay, it's being created. We'll give it 20, 30 seconds. And within 30 seconds, I'll be able to explore the results of the pipeline that are immutable and reproducible because they are snapshots. Okay, it's running within 28 seconds. This is fast. This is really fast. I'll switch to the user interface. Jupyter Hub is not that fast on the other hand, so I'll refresh. Okay. And what do we have here? We have a notebook, a new notebook. 
that already has snapshot one and snapshot two mounted. Snapshot one has counted. Sna file one, file two, file three, full dot gz. No gun zipped file because step two hadn't run yet. This is the input of step two. Okay, let's go back. Snapshot two has file one, file two, file three, full dot gz, and the unzipped file. Why? Because this is after the execution of step two. So I can have full insight into my pipeline. I can go and see exactly what has changed before and after the execution of step two. This is super important when you're debugging the pipeline. So this is snapshot one, and this is snapshot two, my own local clones. This is it. So what we did is we, sp we uh, got Kubeflow running locally within 10 minutes. We used Kubeflow to spin up our notebook within 30 seconds. We, cre we compiled a pipeline that uses local volumes for data exchange. We ran this pipeline starting from a snapshot of a notebook. And then when this pipeline misbehaved or broke, we were able to attach a new notebook into clones of snapshots that happened as the pipeline was running for full uh, introspection. That's it. Any questions you may have? Yes, please. Let me bring you the mic. Thank you for the demo. This was very, very impressive, actually. Thanks. Is there a place where we could find documentation about uh, about Mini KF? There is not much documentation on Mini Kubeflow, but there is lots of nicely written documentation for Kubeflow itself. So Mini Kubeflow is just a packaging of Kubeflow that's meant to run locally, right? So we have tuned Kubeflow so it runs easily and fast on your local laptop. But if you go to... What about the vagrant command that you shared on, the, uh, on your first slide? Ah. Are, you, are you going to share that somewhere? I get it. Yeah, 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 yeah. We have a... Yes, I can show all of this. So there is a blog, a blog entry on the Kubeflow blog that describes mini Kubeflow. And then it points to our website, which is this. And you can find, the network is slow. You can find both where to get support. We have a channel uh, on Kubeflow Slack. And this is the installation guide. Essentially, you need quite some RAM because Kubeflow is hefty. And then prerequisites are running Vagrant, VirtualBox, and running these two commands. This is it. So if you go to Kubeflow's blog, this is the blog. You should find this. It's up and running. And this should point to whatever you may need. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. But I should have a final, yeah, uh, presentation slide for this as well. So let me, oh, I missed it, sorry. <laughs> this is it. Yeah, we're channel hash mini KF on Kubeflow. And if you go to the Kubeflow site, you'll find the Kubeflow blog and everything. Any other question? Thank you. <laughs>